This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong. It's nice to be back in the studio. Happy New Year. Today we're going to talk about the healthcare system of America and compare it with the healthcare systems overseas. Um, there's no better person to, to talk about this with than Ms. Dr. Christopher Flanders. He's the Executive Director of the Hawaii Medical Association. Welcome to the show, Dr. Flanders. Well, thank you for having me and, and Happy New Year. Happy thank New you. Year. Thanks for being here. Now, uh, Dr. Flanders, out of the 35 OECD countries, 32 of them have introduced universal health care, but United States is not one of them. Um, before we get your thoughts on what you think of universal health care for America, could you give us some background into the current state of the American health care system? So as everybody knows, we've been having this discussion for several years that um, everybody felt that the American system is in trouble, is broken, and that we can't we can't continue to spend the amounts of money that we're spending on health care. About 16% of the, of the GDP of the United States goes to health care, and that far exceeds what any other country is spending. So, um, we, you know, we really, it's obvious that we really need to do something to bring down those costs and to get spending under control. Uh, when th this has been going on, there have been several attempts at doing this, as, as people probably have have uh, heard in, in the discussions that going back to the days of Harry Truman in the 1940s there was an attempt and again in the in the 70s with Richard Nixon and again in the 90s with Bill Clinton and then of course when Barack Obama came in in 2008 this was his top priority to, to uh, reform the health care system in some form Were they all fashion. trying to bring it closer to the universal health care system? That certainly is part of the discussion or was part of the discussion and continues to be um, there was a lot of attention paid mostly to the European countries and in Canada as well because you know that that's part of the culture that we're we're familiar with and, and most people in the United States um, are familiar with Europe and and a lot emigrated from there of course. Now Canada is a single payer system is that right? Yeah um, Canada is uh, it, yeah, it, it's it's a single payer system. Although each province, each province, which is their their equivalent of the states, sets up their own system, mm -hmm. but it's all regulated and administered by the federal government in Canada. Um, and a lot of states are are that way. Um, you know, there's universal health care, which sometimes gets confusing because there's single payer, and there's universal health care. Universal health care simply means that everybody has insurance. Mm -hmm and that they've got coverage for, for illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, single payer means that all comes from one source. You know, the other option is and that... And when you say all comes from one source, it could be from the government or the individuals, right? Yeah, it could, it could be from government, it could be from individuals, it could be from employers, mm -hmm. but somehow then that has to be fixed at, at the price side, so there's not a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. um, the other option is just the mandate that all employers supply insurance similar to what we have here in Hawaii mm -hmm. or that um, all individuals purchase insurance like mm -hmm. they've got in Massachusetts. Well, we, uh, we do have a legal mandate right now that Americans are supposed to have health insurance or they pay a penalty. But despite that, there's about 26 million that are uninsured. So right. is there no oversight in, you know, in the mandate? Yeah, the, the oversight is supposed to come from the Internal Revenue Service and they've they've been spinning their wheels trying to get that engaged um, if you notice that uh, on your tax forms there's a spot in there that has the amount that's been paid on on your health insurance or whether or not you've participated in health insurance mm -hmm. so there is there is that mechanism but the the enforcement hasn't really been there yet mm -hmm. I see um, so um, when I look at um, the Obamacare, I think that was the closest America ever came to, you know, having you know, so health care. Mm -hmm. And then when Trump, when Trump came on board, he was trying to repeal Obamacare. But with Trump Care, um, it would actually put 20 to 40 million more people mm -hmm. out of insurance. What do you think about that? I know it eventually it did not yeah. go through. What 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 do you what are your thoughts on that? So, in people having insurance and having 
access to health care is one of the priorities of, of physicians. And that we feel very strongly that everybody needs to have access to, to good quality health care. And if that's getting through insurance, we, we're all for that. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the whole Trump um, thing about doing away with a mandate, I think is more about political philosophy than it is about a working com uh, combination to, to have everybody get access. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really like that. And a lot of the reform uh, propositions that were put forward in, in the United States Congress, the American Medical Association, of which I sit in their House of Delegates, uh, we, we oppose those just based on that, that we feel very strongly that everybody needs to have access to quality care. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the World Organ um, Health Organization ranking and even the ranking mm -hmm. by the Commonwealth Fund, America uh, was ranked last in the Commonwealth Fund ranking. Yeah. They were looking at 11 developed countries. And even in the World Health Organization ranking, where there's 195 countries being looked at, America was ranked number 37 mm -hmm. in overall. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, that, and, and that is part of the concern, of course, right? So why... Do, do you why, think much about those rankings? Do they... Um, yeah, I think we have to pay attention to those. Um, we're spending more money than anybody else um, you would think we'd be at the top. And a lot of that is the access issues, that um, we have pockets in, in the U.S. where we don't have good access to health care. And Hawaii is a good example. We've got, because of our island state nature, we've got a lot of people who live on uh, Hawaii Island, myself included, that um, don't have uh, convenient access to health care. Are you referring to geographical transportation issues? Yeah, geographic and just having a, a even distribution of physicians in in the rural areas is, is one of the other concerns. So, you know, how do we we need to work on a system that um, that not only brings down costs but increases access. Mm -hmm. Is the government providing any kind of incentive to get physicians to work in, you know, suburban or rural areas, just like they do with the teachers in America? Do they do that? Yeah, you know, you think that you think that that would be part of the formula, right? But um, as long as I've been in medicine, it's been kind of a long time now. Mm -hmm. That's been part of the decision. Why don't we incentivize? Why don't we take Medicare dollars and and Medicaid dollars? and pay the rural physicians a higher rate than the urban physicians. But the, the truth is that it's, it's usually the reverse because the cost of doing business is higher in the, in the cities than it is out in the countryside. So that incentive part of it isn't there. Now there are, it's common to have some um, state, primarily state-centered um, incentives like here in Hawaii, we've got a guaranteed student loan forgiveness program that if a physician graduates from medical school and goes and practices in an underserved area for a given period of time, say five years, then those, the state will forgive those loans. Mm -hmm. And those have shown some promise and, 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 and some, some success. Was Hawaii the first state to do that or? No, that's been fairly common. And actually, we, we had to work kind of hard to get that program put into, into place. Um, those programs have been around for quite a while. It used to be that um, there was the National Health Corps set up where, um, and you remember the show Northern Exposure, where it was the, the young doctor who was put in this, this small town in, in rural Alaska. And that was part of that that whole program to pay off the loans. And so it's those kind of things that we really need to implement, I think. And is the funding for those pro programs coming from the state side, or? It's kind of a mix. Here in Hawaii, there's, um, there's a grant that we receive from the federal government that is a matching grant. So every, every dollar that the state puts into it, the U.S. government will match that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, a partnership on mm -hmm. that. Now, would you agree that, you know, um, not just, not only do we need more doctors in rural areas, we need more doctors across the board? Do you, do you think we need that? Um, yeah, I think we do. The studies here in Hawaii have shown that even Honolulu is short on 
positions in some specialties. And, and if you agree with that, may I ask, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, why would the American Medical Association advocate for a cap limit on the number of doctors? Oh, I, I, I don't know that they are advocating oh, for Oh, medical that. students, I'm oh. sorry, medical students. Oh, I think okay. there's a cap limit on that. No, you know, we've actually, the last few years, have been advocating for an increase. And not just in the number of students who um, are in medical school, but what's probably more important at this point is the number of postgraduate spots that are available. And, the, and those are the spots um, that train this, not just the specialties, but family practice, internal medicine are, are, continue, are considered specialties, but they're primary care specialties. But there aren't enough of those spots for every graduate from a US medical school to, to be able to do that. And that's, mm -hmm. With, you know, without that extra training, um, you really can't practice medicine. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, United States, um, United States spend about 18 percent, 16 to 18 percent of the GDP mm. on healthcare costs. Do you think the massive, I, I, I'm guessing it's massive, the massive mm. insurance that comes from malpractice plays into that entire cost calculus? Because America is such a litigious society. <laughs> the, how big of a chunk is that coming from malpractice insurance costs? So, yeah, malpractice insurance does, does play, or not just the insurance part of it, but the response to the threat of litigation also plays a part. And, and most people have probably heard the term of uh, defensive medicine, mm -hmm. where tests that might not normally be ordered get ordered just so they can protect themselves in case they're um, sued. For example, somebody comes into the emergency room with a headache, um, they may get a, a CT scan a CAT scan or an MRI just to rule out that there's not a uh, bleed in the head that's causing the headache. So that's a lot of maybe unnecessary or yeah. um, preventable procedures that need not have happened? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's all how you define necessary and unnecessary. And, and uh, in the system that we have now, we spend a lot of time and effort arguing necessary versus unnecessary testing. What about giving the choice to the patients? Are they well informed enough to decide, you know, should I proceed with such a procedure or not? You know, um, it's, it's an interesting thing that healthcare is probably one of the few areas where uh, if you as a patient are going to make a substantial investment in, in money, and something that you don't ask questions like that. So if you go out and you're gonna buy a new car, you ask a lot of questions about that car of your salespeople and, and you want answers and you decide whether or not that, that particular car is worth the investment you're gonna make in it. But if you go to a surgeon and, and the, number one, the questions aren't ever really asked about you know, experience and, and success rates and those kind of things, but. Uh, so because of the absence of deductibles or co-payments, mm -hmm. um, they are less, um, I guess, prudent about spending. Yeah, I think um, that a lot of patients don't have skin in the game, if you will, that the, they, they do pay a little bit, but the co-pays that we pay in the United States are less than what a lot of countries pay in their co-pays in the countries with, with so-called socialized medicine systems. So they don't really have a big investment other than their personal health. They're financially not a uh, big, uh, big investment made. So they don't, you know, they don't feel like they're, they're pushing to, to ask those questions. Mm. Um, there, there's been talk about different you know, different ways that, that we can have some kind of uh, patient investment in, in their own health care and, you know, either with positive reinforcement with rewards for doing, you know, appropriate behaviors or, or stopping inappropriate behaviors, smoking and so forth, losing, losing weight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Flanders. We're going to take a little break here, and when we come back, we're going to compare and contrast some of the um, healthcare system uh, in the world with America's system. Thank you so much.
Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hello, hi, and welcome back to Asian Review. Today we have with us um, in the studio Dr. Christopher Flanders, who's the Executive Director of the Hawaii Medical Association. And he's, he's here with us today to, to compare and contrast the American healthcare system with those overseas of similarly developed nations. So, wow. um, Dr. Flanders, this country is, to put it positively, in a positive way, is equitably polarized. So when liberals look to, you know, look for examples to support their, their stance for universal health care, they can look to Canada, which is a single-payer system. They look to France, which is a multi-payer system. They can look to the Scandinavian countries. And they can even look to Germany, which is a hybrid system. Um, could you share with us what are your thoughts on some of the, you know, European systems? There's a lot of attention paid for that. And um, I think that primarily that attention um, was geared at the at the European areas rather than than some of the other areas. Um, that's where kind of this whole s socialized healthcare system started. Norway started there; they were the first country to try this, and they did that in I believe it was 1912, sometime in there about a hundred years ago. Um, a lot of the European countries, and I, I think almost all of them now, have gone that route. Uh, they've done it different ways, um, and in some nations. It's the federal government that administers and, and runs through payroll tax and those kind of mechanisms, um, the cost of paying for health care. Uh, in some countries, there's a mandate either to the employees or to the employers that they supply their own or, or their, uh, their workers' health care. And how are they doing financial-wise? Is there, I, I imagine that's a huge financial strain. I know Britain is a truly socialized, you know, mm -hmm. has a truly socialized healthcare system, but they are sort of collapsing under the financial strand. Yeah, they are. Um, every, you know, we, we're having trouble with trying to control the rising costs of healthcare, but every other country is having problems controlling their healthcare costs too. It's not something that's unique to the American system. Um, the healthcare inflation is, is worldwide. And a lot of that is, um, is geared because of the increasing technology that we use in healthcare. The things like the sophisticated studies like the MRIs and the, the new PET scans the, the, uh, that are, are kind of nuclear based, um, those aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, those have all co co cost money. And, and unfortunately, when they do the ranking, they don't look too much into those innovations. They, they do take a peek at it, and they, yeah. you know, they complement U.S. on innovation and medical yeah. technology that really benefits citizens across the world. Um, but there's other issues they look at, like accessibility, mm -hmm. quality of care, and outcomes, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things are hard to quantitate. So I think that um, unless it leads directly to improvement in, in longevity or increased quality of life that's measurable, that, that it doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, but, those, but those are things that every country is, is trying to deal with, is, is to how we, how we control the, the overall costs of health care. And it, like you mentioned, um, Britain is, I, I, uh, my wife and I went to London last year, uh, and we met with a couple of uh, uh, of families from from Britain, and they all remark that um, Britain goes is billions of dollars in debt in paying for their health care system that it doesn't pay for itself even with the taxes that are charged and of course nobody wants to pay more taxes so you know they're trying to struggle with that um, 
And Norway is highly socialized too. Do you it think is. it's because they are, you know, supported by their massive oil reserves because they have money coming in from other <laughs> sources to support that kind yeah, of system? Yeah, it's absolutely oil in, in Norway. Yeah, the the, um, the way they've got that set up is is that, uh, you know, this is kind of off on a tangent, but the, the, the federal government owns the oil fields and they, they contract with the, the oil companies to pull out the oil, but the oil belongs to them. So all that money comes into the country mm -hmm. and that's used to pay for health care and, and a lot of other things. It's really a very progressive and interesting nation. Mm -hmm. We know the French system was ranked number one you know, mm -hmm. among the OECD countries. Is there any good from the French system that you think we could take and implement it here? Um, you know, there are a lot of the ideas about uh, the access and the ease in getting into the healthcare system mm -hmm. because as, as we all know, the healthcare system is, is difficult to navigate once you get in. Things tend to, when things happen, they tend to happen fast and, and they, they tend to progress very quickly mm -hmm. and people end up just getting swept along with the flow of the healthcare system, mm -hmm. whether it's in a, in a clinic or in, in the hospital. Um, France, I think, maybe has a better, better grip on that. Mm -hmm. um, their costs tend to be fairly low, and I think that's because the, the prices get set a little bit tighter. And that's where a lot of the countries have focused their attention now, is uh, some central mechanism to fix prices. Japan, if, if we move over to Asia, um, for example. Um, if if all, I could interrupt you just yeah. a, when you said, you know, the intervention on the prices, are they trying to fix the prices on the insurance products or prices on the medical system itself? Because that's. Yeah, it's kind, it's kind of both. Mm. That um, it's not so much on the premium side, although that probably comes along with it, but on the, on the payment side, um, for example, I was going to get into Japan, mm -hmm. um, maintains very tight control over their fee schedule. So even though people might have different insurance companies that are paying the, the, the physicians in the hospitals, all physicians in all hospitals get paid the same for the same procedure. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no competition, really. It's single payer, even though there are multiple companies that are paying in. The, um, then what they can do, what the federal government in Japan can do, is that they can regulate the, the budget mm -hmm. by adjusting those, that fee schedule up or down. Mm -hmm. if, they've got a, if they've got to tighten up on the amount of money that's going out, they lower that fee schedule. Mm -hmm. So earlier we talked about some of the examples, that, you know, the liberals will look to. I, I like to measure mm -hmm. examples that the conservatives frequently look to besides Japan, and that's Singapore. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard much about the healthcare system? No, I don't know that much about the healthcare mm -hmm. system. I know that they've got a, a, a socialized program, mm -hmm. more or less, and a universal system, but I'm, I'm not that familiar as mm -hmm. to how, how that's set up. Yeah, well, I'm from there, so if you don't mind, I'll share yeah, the background. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. love to hear So uh, the conservatives sort of hailed that as the, as the gold standard. In fact, Fox News was advocating for America to copy Singapore, you know, healthcare miracle. So in Singapore is based on three M's. That's the MediSafe, MediShield, and the MediFund. Mm -hmm. So the MediSafe is a mandatory health savings account. Um, every Singaporean worker have to contribute 7 to 9.5% of their mm -hmm. wages into that account. And this, is, this pays primarily for routine care. And it pushes the customers to look at um, routine care as a product, just like when you buy your shoes, when you buy your bag, you would think before you pay, versus you were giving a good example about how people in America, they, they don't mm -hmm. ask those questions, they'll just go with the procedures that's being recommended by the doctor. But in Singapore, because it's coming out of their own pocket essentially, yeah. they would inquire, is this necessary, why am I doing this? And then we have the medical shield, so that when they hit the um, deductible, they can move on to the medical shield. And that will cover, you know, the additional cost. So everybody has MediSafe, and MediShield is optional. We're automatically enrolled, but it's optional. You can opt out of it. And there's also a safety net, which is the MediFund. 
and that is funded by an uh, investment income of a $3 billion um, endowment. So we don't touch the principal. And for 2018, we will just be using the investment income from 2017 mm -hmm. to pay for those who absolutely cannot pay. So it's sort of a payer of last resort. Um, I know that America has sort of been looking at the Singapore system as well. Do you think such a system, based on just you know how I briefly described, do you think such a system will work in the United States, a mandatory health savings account? You know, I, I, yeah, I'm intrigued by that idea because prior to the Affordable Care Act, um, there were states that were developing the, the um, medical savings account systems. And for, I had one for several years. And it actually worked pretty well because um, it's a high, high deductible insurance company, meaning that you would have to pay the first amount of, you know, three thousand dollars or something of your health care, but you could also contribute a matching amount, so three thousand dollars into a savings account that you could use to pay that. Now the. Um, you know, that kind of puts, puts skin in the game for, for yeah, patients yeah. because when, the, when they go in and you say, now all of a sudden they've got to pull out the credit card that the bank gave them that has all the money that they've been able to save up and they know how much that money is and they know how much is going to, they want to know how much money is going to come out if they decide that they do want to go through with, you know, having this mole excised from my neck or whatever it might be. And, and so you start get, getting this give and take. And you know, I, I think that's a good thing. I think that, that more patient engagement we get, the better off we, that the system will be. I think you hit the nail on the head when you say it gets the patient's skin in the game. And Singapore system is truly the only universal healthcare system that gets the patients to pay for mm -hmm. the chunk of the healthcare costs. Um, the government actually pays just a quarter of the patient cost mm. in the country. Yeah, so instead of having the insurance pay for most of the cost, which is you know evident in Western Europe and United States, the patients are the one that pays the larger chunk of the cost. Yeah. So they are forced to take responsibility for their own health. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the pharmaceutical cost because I know that's skyrocketing in the United States too. Yeah. Um, why, why does um, Medicaid prohibit, I mean, there's a law um, that prohibits them from negotiating down the prices of the, the pharmaceutical products. Why is that? You know, I don't, I don't know what the history of that is because to, to me and to a lot of people, that just doesn't make any sense. We negotiate it on the price of everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why is, that, is there such a carve out? Um, I don't really understand. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of attention paid to the cost of pharmaceuticals as a whole as to the last five, six years or so especially. The price of pharmaceuticals has just skyrocketed and even on drugs that have been around for years and years and you know we ask the pharmaceutical companies you know what's going on here? Why, why is this happening? And you know I don't, I don't know that we've really been able to get a get a coherent answer as to what that costs. But that, I mean, if you have to point a finger at, at things, you know, that, that's probably one of, the, one of the things that we need to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Do you think the doctors should bear some of that responsibility too? Because I know that pharmaceutical companies will sometimes woo doctors with incentive, they'll send mm -hmm. them to resorts, um, expensive dinners, gifts, gifts like that. Is there any ethical oversight as far as, you know, where does the line stop? Yeah. You know, that, yeah, that doesn't really happen. Mm. I mean, that maybe used to happen, but now, for the most part, um, if you're going to if you're gonna go, they, it used to be that they did training for physicians, and we'd be able to get our continuing medical education at programs that were, that were paid for by pharmaceutical companies, and, and that, that's kind of disappeared. The... Um, you know the vacations and those things haven't been around in in my my time in medicine, so I'm not sure. You know, just where you know that that doesn't happen anymore. But um, you know, they, the pharmaceutical companies still can be an important source of information on new drug developments because there are questions that we need to ask about effectiveness and efficiency of of drug regimens that only somebody associated with the pharmacology industry would know. 
particularly. So, you know, I think there's still a role in there. Um, you know, there was never a kickback. There was never a, you, you know, we don't get paid for prescribing certain drug or whatever. And because I hear that periodically, and mm -hmm. that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. I'm so, well, very glad to hear that. Yeah. Well, Dr. Flanders, thank you so much for being with us today. I wish we had more time, but we'll come yeah. to the end of the show. Thank well, you so thank, much for being with us. Thank you for having thank me. You.